we don't want to invoke unnecessary fear, which I think is a lot of the lack of education is doing right now. The thing that was so unique about Silicon Valley Bank really was this increase in interest rates mixed and combined with the type of person banking at that bank, right? So it really isn't something that I think should strike a lot of concern across all of the banking industry where we all need to make a run on our own individual banks. But it really was isolated the fact that like, hey, these two things kind of culminated together at a perfect time to create these problems. Welcome to another episode of Dental Riffs. I'm your co-host, Gary Bird. I'm the CEO of SMC National, where we provide predictable new patient flow for offices just like yours. Hello, hello. I'm Tanner Applegate, CEO and co-founder of Unified Dental. We are a software solution helping you manage all of the different applications that you guys have across all of your different platforms. So we got two topics today. One is super excited that I'm like really excited to share with the audience. And I, I haven't showed you yet, Tanner. So you're I, I know you're going to love this. this. You're going to love this. Okay. But the first one is actually a little bit somber. And honestly, it's bringing back 2008 vibes. Like for the audience that's old enough to remember 2008, What's going on in the economy right now is very, very similar. And Tanner, Tanner, you wanted to talk about a little bit about how this has been impacting people directly with you that you know in the dental industry. Yeah. So for those that kind of, uh, I guess, maybe know, maybe don't know, I am a early stage startup, right? I've only been working on my tech startup for the last six months, eight months or so. Um, and so we're really fortunate to kind of be where we're at in our growth and kind of development stages. But with that, I've been really kind of networked into this tech startup space. And for those that may have heard, may not have heard, Silicon Valley Bank, right, was it, they recently went under um, and ended up getting all of their assets and everything seized by the FDIC. And so now everything's kind of on pause there. Well, the reason why this is interesting to me specifically is that Silicon Valley Bank obviously is the banking of a lot of new startups. Yeah. Right. So you go out, you raise a few round, you raise around, you take that money, you put it in your bank account, and then you sit there and plan on utilizing that money throughout the rest of the development of your company. Well, unfortunately, in some of these groups that I've been a part of, a lot of people have been directly impacted by this. Right. So I just wanted to kind of acknowledge it and um, put out some ideas or thoughts on this as well. Hey, sorry to disrupt the show, but I just have a quick commercial for you. We are going to be hosting four events over the next 12 months, and we're doing a little bit of everything for everybody. We have something around Full Arch. We have something for those that manage marketing. We have something for those that want to scale their practice at Dykema. And then also, we have something next year that's for everybody in your practice to learn business skills and to really maximize the opportunities for you to grow your offices. You're not going to want to miss these. Visit smcnational.com forward slash events. These are going to be the premier events that you're going to want to go to to make sure that you're getting the tactical skills that you need to continue to grow the way that you want. Because at SMC, we're all about growing. So, Gary, how far into this story kind of have you found yourself? Very. Um, it's I spent all weekend listening and watching and reading as much as I could about it. And so I think I have a, a decent understanding of what's going on. It, again, it's very sim to me, it's very similar to 2008. The difference is... The, the securities that tanked the banks in 2008 were balloon mortgages on houses. It's basically uh, uh, loans that just should have never been given um, to, and, and the way that they were created and who they were given to. So, But now it's people who took money from... These are more like startups, like what you, to, what you alluded to, which is a ri risky business to be in, right? But there's a lot of money flowing to it uh, through 2020 forward. And what happened was, is they took the money that they got from these deposits of people from investors and they put them into what would normally be looked at as not risky investments, low interest rate bonds, things like that. But the problem is, is the feds hiked their rates. And so now, is that your Bing? You're flexing your Bing uh, browser. <laughs> um, so, so the feds are flexing their... Um, or the Fed, the Feds uh, flexed up their their uh, their interest rates, right? And now those investments that were safe investments before are losses. So you would have put a hundred dollars in. Now it's only worth sixty dollars. And then there was a run on the bank because of fear. 
So they had to sell their positions to get that money back, but they were taking their money at a loss because they were pulling it out of investments early and it was all bad. Now, if it's just an isolated thing, probably not the end of the world. It's gonna, it could, but it could trickle down into the companies that you're talking about that could cause more layoffs, more things like that. So I'd love to go into that. And then I also could see a, a world where this really starts to impact dental as well. Yeah, the thing though that was unique about this compared to 2008, and I want to make sure that we reiterate this too, is because education is kind of the most important aspect of this, right? We don't want to invoke unnecessary fear, which I think is a lot of the lack of education is doing right now. The thing that was so unique about Silicon Valley Bank really was this increase in interest rates mixed and combined with the type of person banking at that bank, right? So it's not it's not something that really applies bank. I mean, industry-wide across all banks, it was just kind of this whole idea of like, okay, techs have taken this dip. All of a sudden, now they're needing to draw down more funds. Well, the bank doesn't have the funds there because of that fact that like, hey, interest rates have shot up and these bonds that I should be getting a decent return on are no longer getting it because I got them earlier when the interest rates were low, right? So it really isn't something that I think should strike a lot of concern across all of the banking industry where we all need to make a run on our own individual banks. But it really was isolated to the fact that like, hey, these two things kind of culminated together at a perfect time to create these problems, right? And so, and even really for them, the FDIC, as which it's built to do, stepped in at the perfect time to make it so that it actually stopped a lot of the, the sell-off bleeding. from the yeah. shares, all the et cetera, right? And so now all these people that do have cash in this bank, they will be able to get it out, right? The concern is not that they will never be able to access this cash again. It's a matter of timing of yeah. when, right? If I got payroll due tomorrow yes. and I need $500,000 today, well, FDIC is only up to 250. I can get that out immediately. But what am I going to do about the other two? So, so let's talk about let's talk about that, about that trickle down because that is a big, big deal because this is one of the main banks that does loan to a lot of these tech startups in, in, in California. And so... This the trickle down effect, as far as I understand it, and this is I'm a little a little more shaky on uh, of an understanding. So I'd love your feedback on this. Is that people's funds that they had access to before are now frozen? So now you need to go make payroll. You need to go uh, pay for whatever you know expenditures your business has, and you don't have access to that money. And the and it might be a while, right? Like they're trying to get the money freed up, but it might be a while. And so this is where the non bailout bailout comes in, right? Where they're like, this isn't a bailout, but it is kind of a bailout where they're like, no, we're going to cover the funds. The Fed says we're going to cover the funds and we're going to make sure that everybody can access that money and and it's going to be dollar for dollar. So that way you get it back. But the bank's still going to be at a loss overall. So someone's going to end up holding that bag. Right now, though, the bank actually isn't at a loss, right? If you were to take the company and actually sell it exactly for what it's worth, then it's actually not at a loss. And that that's why the leverage of assets to liabilities, they could cover all of their liabilities, right? But it was just because of the fact that there was this concern of timing. like, oh, if I have to keep selling off all of our assets in order to, to pay out these people that are pulling it out, that's where the valuation of the company goes down and that's where it would be screwed. So the FDIC stepping in and kind of taking control actually was like perfect because now that balance between assets and liabilities actually ends up becoming a lot more of a fit, Mm -hmm. right? And that's why they took over when they did instead of waiting for it to bleed out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, So do you, where I, what I made me really nervous, Tanner, is that as I'm watching this, I'm thinking about first thing in my brain is how much money do I have in a bank and is it insured, right? Like is all the money that I have everywhere insured? Not because... I think that this is going to happen again somewhere else or something like that. But what I what I really what I'm really concerned about is that people will run on the banks on these smaller, especially smaller banks that are like more localized and things like that. I could see people being scared of that and going and pulling their money and having the same thing happen. And also, I'm also worried about the banks not like someone didn't pay attention that the the rates were being raised and this was going to cause a problem or they were paying attention. They didn't say anything or so, something happened. I, I, I can see things like this happening. I actually had in before this happened, I had in my show notes to talk about auto loans and how interest rates have doubled on cars and how loan de, uh, defaults are up 6% and that they're, uh, uh, they're up 6% just recently, but they're up 30% from a year ago. And the average note on a car right now is $1,000 a month. Well, that's 
really bad. And that could go really, really south. If we have a bunch of, let's just use, I'm just going to make up a, a hypothetical, not for fear, but just like something I could see in reality. If the bank's funds that that shut down Silicon Valley Bank, if they stay frozen and there's some a bunch of layoffs in tech because people don't have the money to pay their their staff, and then people start defaulting more on car loans, banks that are heavily involved with local car loans, things like you could you could see in a world where that could cause some problems in some banks, and so I just that's what gave me the the chill factor because that also then goes into dentistry, right? Because people need money to pay for dentistry, and so. I feel like we're at this like tipping point right before a bigger recession or bigger problems, but it could be we're, this is like the tail end of the cleanup that we're going through as well. What what do you, what do you think? I'm probably more optimistic of all of this in general, right? If you look at the Silicon Valley Bank specifically, this culmination of everything that happened, it really is pretty isolated to Silicon Valley by itself, right? Sure, you may end up with things like mortgage defaults, you might end up things with like uh, auto loan default, et cetera, as a, as a repercussion of the fact that like, Hey, I'm not getting paid for another month. Right. So maybe I'll put a pause on my auto loan, et cetera, or maybe I'll end up getting laid off in general. All of those things though, are isolated to this one kind of geographical area where this bank had a large footprint, right? Sure. You might get a couple of defaults here and there outside of the Silicon Valley, but I don't think it's going to end up replicating to this point where it's a huge issue across the entire industry right so that's kind of i guess my optimistic view of it is that this is not something that really needs to worry everybody nationally i think that from dental sure it may end up impacting your dental offices there locally in the silicon valley but the reality is is those guys have already been impacted already before because with the layoffs and everything there is a geographical kind of issue happening there right and even honestly geographically there my my honest thoughts are there's so much opportunity if you can master marketing right in dental that the people that were doing it are going to be fine anyway right you're not going to have a big enough impact that your dental office if you run it if you're the one listening to this type of podcast hopefully you're running our office efficient efficiently enough that it's not going to be a concern for you okay so how many customers do you think silicon valley bank has who i have no idea it just take a guess I, I have no idea either. I googled it. Uh, I'm going to say customers as in businesses. Uh, just like people 000. who bank there. Oh, people that bank there too. Probably up now into the millions, a couple million. 40,000 customers. <laughs> <laughs> Individuals or businesses? Customers. Just, that's all of them. Yeah. Wow. It's Silicon Valley Bank, 40,000 customers are mostly tech companies. The bank provides services around half the U.S. startups. But those tech companies are tattooed into the fabric of daily lives across the U.S. and beyond. So, but but that again, each each of those customers might have how many employees each, right? How many? It might be it might be a hundred, might be a thousand. I don't know um, who you know the customer rate. So to give you an idea, Wells Fargo um, services more than seventy million customers um, across the U.S. So just to give you like an idea, but then again, those probably aren't as many, you know, tech businesses, those kind of things. So, so uh, do you know the toy store camp? No camp. They're they're. I mean, they're really kind of high end toy stores, right? So you'll find them in these like really kind of wealthier areas of larger metropolitan areas. So in New York, they were there quite a bit. And it was always my favorite because you could run in, let the kids run around and play. Like they had a lot of like available toys for you to play in. And so like we do the long walk, we'd end up in this area, let the kids run around and play. Well, my wife and I actually found a seat to sit and rest in, in these toy stores. So camp was one that on Friday, my wife sent me this link. She's like, um, they did this, like when your bank gets shut down special <laughs> where they put everything on 40 percent off because they needed the, the cash, cash flow yeah. for payroll yeah so i was like that's the type of company that's like figuring out and making it happen it's not waiting around and hoping that it ends up resolving in their oh, favor that's so good they're like this is what we're doing now and this is what it did and, and then my wife was like she got on a couple hours after it first announced she's like everything was sold out like there was nothing on their website that i could even buy yeah. so i think that that was a brilliant kind of move on their part to like run this emergency ad campaign the fact that they were able to sell everything pulled together in the matter of hours was amazing yeah that's awesome well uh um, that's 
not a luxury everyone has. They don't have a bunch of equity sitting in in uh, stock. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, in uh, yeah, yeah, stock in is. inventory. Yeah, okay, inventory. So, so overall message from Tanner is: don't be too worried about this. Um, we're going to be able to keep chugging along, and um, I tend to agree with you. Um, I do see that there this might trickle on longer, but I don't know what that looks and feels like, and I don't I don't think anybody does. We're all kind of speculating, but. F- being fearful to your point, Tanner, being fearful and running on the banks and those kind of things definitely wouldn't help anything. So don't, don't do that. If, if you're listening to this now, I, um, I have something else to show you. So you want to see the cool thing that I wanted to show you? Okay. You're going to love this. All right. Now I'm going to show this to you guys and you're going to really like it. And then I'm going to tell you how to actually access it. Okay. Cause it's not just out of the box. So you're going to pick one of these. Um, I'll start with the buyer persona legend. And then what you're going to want to do is obviously you want to pick your language and then you pick your, your style, uh, that you want it written in. I'm just going to pick clinical and then, uh, you can pick how you want it written. Um, the writing style. So I'll just say analytical and, um, what does the business sell? Full arch dental implants. And where does it sell it? Let's say in Long Beach, California. And you hit enter. And then what it's going to do is it's going to start to build out a buyer persona for you. And it's going to really start to tell you a lot about this particular person in that particular market. Um, as long with their budget there, um, they're going to be referred. So that, so that's that, um, one, but then let's take, um, that same thing and then use this one. And what's our product, uh, ABC dental. So now it's going to actually write up more about like the behaviors of this individual. Yeah, this is incredible to me. What I'm even more fascinated about that I want to dig into is what is the structure behind this, right? So is it the extension that's pushing in the prompt that is generating that out? It's just prompts. So once you know how to create a prompt for G- uh, chat GPT or any AI, you then can build on top of that prompt. And you all this guy did. And so, so let me do this real quick, Tanner, before I explain this. If you want something like this, just message us, DM us on Instagram. So go to Dental Riffs, follow us on there, DM us. And, um, and we will, we will shoot you, I will shoot you the, the, uh, Chrome extension to do this. It's totally free. It doesn't cost anything. Um, but what basically what it does Tanner is that he built a Chrome extension and he has it for tons of stuff. He has SEO, all these different things. And so what basically what he went in and he's like, okay, chat GPT can pull this information. What is the prompt to get it to wait, lay out the way that I want? And then what do I need these people to type in to give them the outcome that they're looking for? So all I'm doing is typing in um, dental office, GP office in city, and then it's 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 building all the other prompts around it to give me the outcome that I want. But it didn't have the prompts in there, right? So is it using the OpenAI API? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just a prompted, it's a pre-prompt. So it built into the user interface of chat GPT, even though it's not using the user interface, just because the customer want is comfortable with the user interface. Yeah. hundred percent. He has over, this is, guy has over 40, 41 prompts. So he has Quora answer prompts, generate buyer personas, create the perfect persona, eye catching product, sales pitch and email, social media campaigns, social media engagement replies, create a buyer persona based on a given URL your personal headhunter and career coach, personal fitness trainer, your your person uh, your personal ghostwriter. Um, some of them were not as great. That one was really good. That one I actually went in and I was like playing with it and trying to like throw it off. It's pretty good. Like it's going to get you ninety percent of the way there to build your persona. And again, that research that I showed showed you, I've done it before personally for dental offices. Right. That takes a lot of time. Like you have to go into the market, find the average age. Okay. And it's a, it's always a woman. And then what, okay, what kind of career does that woman have? Where does she shop? What are her interests? You can do it all, almost all of it in Google, but it takes time. It takes hours. Dang, yeah. So anyways, I, I thought awesome. that was that's awesome. Really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. And that, that it goes to speak. I mean, for those that don't know, I'm also doing a weekly webinar on kind of like AI tools in general and how to utilize them across dental and offices. And one of the conversations that we have is like, we, do we need to continue to push teaching prompt engineering? And my gut is prompt engineering is going to be dead in the next six months. Yeah, people. Right? Are gonna... It'll be tools like this that end up 
end up dominating. Obviously, if you know prompt engineering and you can master it, great, you'll be ahead. But the reality is, is like prompt engineering is a skill set that'll then become commoditized as well. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, there, there's, there's everybody's going to solve it. Remember when you used to first when computers first came out, like you literally had to know how to prompt it to do what you wanted it to do, right? Yeah, like you were right. doing DOS. Line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you were like, enter. And then it was like, oh, I missed, a, I missed a letter in there. And you'd had to like, you had to get it like perfect and memorize this code to get the computer to do what you wanted it to do or else it was just a big block. AI is the same exact way. Like it's, it's starting off like, okay, you got to learn this prompt and you got to do this and you got to do that. But it, it, soon to your point, you're not going to need all that stuff. Someone's just going to have one search engine that if you want to do a particular thing, you just punch it in there and it's going to do it for you. Right. So awesome, see, man. It's awesome. That's cool. I like that tool, man. You got to send it my way. I will. I'll shoot you the video I shot to my team on how to use it. Consider me reaching out on Instagram now. All right. Later. Later.